So this is time. Welcome, Dr. G. Bang, and uh, to introduce you to Indian neurologist, Professor G. Dr. G. Bang is a sin professor of neurology in John Hopkins University, USA, and uh, she has huge amount of work in in Huntington disease and dementia. Today she will talking on Huntington disease clinical overview and dawn of new era of therapeutics. As we all know that Huntington's there's some exciting development over the last two three years time. So she'll touch upon clinical overview as well as therapy. Dr. G. Bang, all yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers for this very kind invitation. And I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. All right, so here we go. These are my disclosures. And this is the outline of my talk. These are the topics I'm planning uh, on covering today or tonight for you all. So uh, introduction on Huntington disease. So this uh, disease was named after Dr. George Huntington. And he's the first person to really methodically and thoroughly describe the disease. And in 1872, he um, published this uh, description, which was three paragraphs long, uh, but uh, was considered to be the most thorough description of the disease. And the um, the description was based on his not only his own observation, uh, but those of his own father and his grandfather, um, as all three of them were physicians in the same town in New York. And throughout those generations, they've observed in other families this uh, pattern of disease um, with the um, similar symptoms that were running in families. And the Huntington disease has prevalence of between five to 10 out of 100,000 in North America and in Europe. And it's been confirmed in all races across the, across the globe. And the prevalence really does vary though. Um, and this uneven distribution of HD is at least partially explained by the distribution of specific predisposing alleles and haplotypes in the general population of different uh, ethnic groups. So for example, uh, highest uh, prevalence is found in Hispanic Americans and Northern Europeans, and the lowest is in Black Africans and East Asians. Uh, back to the US, there are about 30,000 people that are estimated to be afflicted with HD. And additionally, uh, approximately somewhere between 150,000 to 250,000 that are at risk. And the focus of uh, tonight's talk is uh, adult onset HD, which is the much more common type as opposed to juvenile HD. So for the adult HD, age of onset is between 30 to 50 years of age. Um, of course, there are outliers in either direction. So we see 20 some year olds with full onset HD and we see 70 plus year olds uh, with the first onset of symptoms as well. And disease duration average is 15 to 20 years. Um, but again, we see a lot of out outliers in either direction. When we talk about the clinical symptoms of HD, we really talk about a triad of symptoms. They include motor, cognitive, and behavioral. And one person might have predominantly one or two or all of these symptoms. Um, or they might start out in one of these domains, and then as they progress, they might have additional uh, symptoms in the other uh, domains. So for example, uh, these are uh, in, in the top uh, box there, those are the motor symptoms you may see in HD, and we'll get um, more into detail with each of these categories. And cognitively in the middle box, those are uh, mainly executive function time problems that people develop. And the bottom box, um, those are the emotional symptoms that are commonly seen in HD. So let's talk about Korea, as that is the most uh, widely um, known and um, common uh, symptom of HD. So let's see, I'm gonna play and mute. So Korea is this brief, irregular, involuntary movements, and they're often compared to the flowing movements of dance. So in this patient, 
uh, you can see a lot of um, Trunkal uh, Korea, and they're also um, present proximally in the upper extremities, uh, as well as lower extremities. And you can also see her mouth pursing, uh, as you can see um, mouth involvement uh, or face involvement um, often as well. So let me see if I can, well, I was going to play and tell you about it. I'm just gonna play it one more time and maybe just talk through it. So um, again, Korea is the general, generally most predominant initial motor symptom. And you can see the athetoid movements of, fing uh, well, usually fingers and toes um, initially, but then, then they uh, progress to involve proximal areas as well. Um, and it's present in over 90% of people affected by HD. And these are some of the facts. Um, and if they're mild, they can be suppressed. Um, but with cognitive load, um, when you distract them, have them perform other tasks, um, they can be uh, brought out more strongly. And if they're really severe, they do and uh, do tend to interfere with balance, leading them to uh, fall. So that was Korea, but also um, there are other symptoms uh, within the motor domain that are commonly affected. So um, Korea would be a type of involuntary movement that's involved. And um, again, it's present early in the course. But uh, voluntary uh, motor uh, symptoms are also quite common, and these include incoordination and bradykinesia. Um, this is probably the only other time I'll mention juvenile HD. Um, voluntary symptoms tend to be uh, earlier, present earlier in juvenile HD, whereas the opposite is the case in adult onset HD. So involuntary or chorea happens earlier in adult onset HD, but voluntary uh, movement problems occur early in juvenile HD. Um, and even though when Korea is severe, it can uh, interfere with balance, as I mentioned, mostly it's the voluntary um, motor symptoms that are more disabling uh, for the patients with the incoordination and bradykinesia um, that makes it harder for them to perform daily actions um, rather than mild or milder chorea. Uh, let's talk about cognitive symptoms. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, these tend to be more in the executive function domain. And I will uh, come back to this a few more times throughout this talk, uh, but cognitive impairments can emerge years before the diagnosis of HD. And diagnosis of HD, as I'll talk about later, really um, depends on the motor symptom presentation. So before anything clinically is visible in the motor realm, there usually are some kind of cognitive Im impairments that are present years before. And it's gradual. And the types of uh, cognitive symptoms, again, this executive function problems, sort of the striatal subcortical uh, problems are similar to what you would see in Parkinson's and vascular dementia. So there's cognitive slowing, problem with attention, mental inflexibility, working memory problems, and poor ability to plan and organize. So clinically, um, symbol digit modalities test is a, is a test of visual attention and psychomotor speed. And uh, Stroop word reading test, which tests psychomotor speed, these two have the greatest sensitivity to progression in early HD. And I'm just showing the picture here. Um, I mean, this tests various functions, but you can also see perseveration coming out um, in this test when people are asked to draw different um, connections between these dots. And the third uh, of the symptom triad is behavioral or emotional. And these are some of the common symptoms we see. 
So I'll just talk about, uh, I'll start with apathy. And this is very commonly found in HD and is, can be quite disabling. And most patients by the later stages of the disease tend to have apathy um, as it does worsen over time. And it's the single psychiatric indicator that demonstrates clear longitudinal progression. You can see it even in pre-manifest individuals. And in early HD, baseline apathy scores uh, are is a significant baseline predictor of functional decline. Irritability is another um, common feature in uh, HD and also in pre-motor HD. And in early HD, baseline irritability scores um, was, uh, is a significant baseline predictor of functional decline. And irritability is also related to impulsivity and aggression. Next is obsessive uh, compulsive symptoms, which is found in anywhere between 22 to 50% of HD patients. And this also can be one of the earliest clinical symptoms. And these are some of the types of um, obsessive compulsive um, traits um, that, that have been found in a study. Another uh, very common behavioral symptom or emotional symptom is depression. And there's 30 to 40% lifetime prevalence of clinical depression in HD. And in another study, um, depressed mood was present in up to 60% of patients. And so an older study, um, but this uh, found that suicide rate was four to six times higher um, in the HD population than in general population. Mania and psychosis can also be found in HD. Um, sometimes uh, people uh, can be misdiagnosed as having bipolar as a result because they have these periods of mania um, alternating with um, periods of really low mood. Um, psychosis uh, is possibly understudied. Um, in, in this particular study, 30% of patients had symptoms of psychosis, whether it's hallucinations and or delusions. And um, there are, uh, you know, there are more studies trying to really get at the true prevalence of psychosis. Um, but certainly we have um, been seeing patients with these symptoms as a result of HD. And I'm just going to briefly touch on, this is the only slide um, on differential diagnoses of HD. Um, this is you know, going into all of these would be um, outside the scope of my talk. Um, but broadly speaking, um, when someone presents with HD, um, differential diagnoses wise, I like to think about genetic versus non-genetic causes of, of um, chorea um, and similar um, psychiatric symptoms, um, especially if the family history isn't there or is clearly absent um, you would want to think about the non-genetic causes. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that it could still very well be HD, as it is the most common cause of adult onset chorea. And missing family history really doesn't mean you can rule it out either um, because of its psychiatric effects and, and the detrimental um, subsequent effects it has on um, sort of their social situation. Um, people might not know somebody else in their family has HD. People may become estranged because uh, other people in the family might think they're just odd or they've gone, um, you know, quote unquote crazy. Um, or um, if they know they have HD, um, they might want to hide it or really try to hide it from the rest of the family. So um, even if family history appears to be absent, um, HD should also always be on the differential uh, in someone who's presenting with uh, chorea and any of those triad of symptoms uh, we discussed. The impact of Huntington disease is, is quite great. Um, it leads to progressive disability and eventually to total dependence. And as I mentioned earlier, cognitive and emotional symptoms can occur even 10 plus years before 
any of the motor symptoms are really visible and can be detected. And early in the disease course, those cognitive and emotional symptoms are often what cause more disability than motor symptoms. And because of that, if the diagnosis of HD goes undetected, that can lead to delays in access to care, which can result in delayed diagnosis and therefore decreased quality of life. All right, so um, these are, again, some of the early uh, signs and symptoms in HD. Um, I'm just gonna direct your attention to the orange line. Um, this was a prospective cohort study looking at those with um, expanded CAG uh, repeat length versus those who did not. Um, and I'll get more into the molecular genetics um, later. Um, so this is to point out that the motor uh, impairment continues to progress over time from the onset of symptoms uh, in the first nine years. And this uh, symbol digit modality is again, um, a uh, cognitive, uh, sensitive cognitive uh, test in HD. The orange line, those with the expanded uh, CAG repeated uh, length continue to have a worsening of uh, this test performance. And I'm gonna skip behavioral be domain, but for now, um, D, total functional capacity, uh, which measures their ability to carry out day-to-day -day functions also continues to decline over time. Coming back to the behavioral um, issues, so the orange, um, as you can see, there isn't really a clear pattern up or down, and that's really reflective of how it, these emotional or behavioral symptoms can occur anywhere along the disease timeline. Okay, so let me talk about the diagnosis of Huntington disease. So currently, the diagnosis is based on history and clinical exam. And it's defined as unequiv unequivocal presence of an otherwise unexplained extrapyramidal movement disorder, such as chorea, dystonia, bradykinesia, or rigidity in a patient at risk for HD. And let me uh, review what we understand as the natural history of clinical HD. So in the middle here, motor diagnosis is when they're evaluated and are observed to have the characteristic extra pyramidal movement disorder that, um, that I just um, went over, the definition. Um, now, that's when they're diagnosed, but before they're diagnosed, to the left of that midline is the uh, you know, pre-manifest period. So pre-manifest period can be further divided into pre-symptomatic or prodromal. So simply pre-symptomatic people really don't have any uh, observable symptoms at all. Um, whereas in the prodromal phase, they have some subtle symptoms. It may be chorea or other motor impairment or cognitive impairment. And up here, their functional abilities might um, slowly um, or subtly be declining. So for example, if they're working, um, they may still be able to meet their goals and deadlines and accomplish um, what they're supposed to do, accomplish their tasks, but in reality, it might be taking them longer. Um, they may be less efficient, um, but uh, just on the surface, it may look like they're not really having a problem per se. Once someone is diagnosed uh, based on the motor symptoms, then you see that uh, functional abilities continue to decline over time, and the rest of the symptoms continue to progress uh, or worsen over time. Um, of note, chorea uh, tends to either plateau or kind of burn out as the disease progresses, and there um, it's more um, replaced or, or the predominance is replaced by the other types of motor impairment that I alluded to, such as in coordination, bradykinesia, some of the voluntary um, movement problems. So um, given the recognition that um, there are subtle symptoms that are present years before the motor diagnosis, um, we uh, 
published a, a proposal to uh, basically refine the current um, criteria. So some of the goals that this proposal is trying to address. One is we want to make the criteria applicable in both clinical and research settings. And importantly, we want to incorporate both cognitive and motor features into the diagnostic criteria. So again, for example, someone in the um, prodromal um, phase can be diagnosed um, when they have some motor symptoms or some motor changes along with either unchanged or mild or significant cognitive change so that um, when disease modifying therapies do become available an earlier diagnosis may allow for an earlier intervention so that was clinical features and diagnosis and next i'm going to uh, review some molecular genetics so the Huntington gene, or the HTT gene, it's located on uh, the human chromosome four, on the short arm of four, and it contains the CAG repeat coding for polyglutamine. And the CAG expansion mutation is, is located in exon one. And the Huntington gene is also called the IT15 gene, and IT stands for interesting transcript. And this gene spans over 200 kilobases and contains 67 exons. And the encoded protein, which is also called Huntington, so the gene and the protein are called Huntington, but with an I, whereas the disease is called Huntington with an O. Um, so the protein Huntington consists of over 3,000 amino acid residues and has a molecular weight of 350 kilodaltons and Huntington gene is widely expressed throughout the brain and the body. Oh, so um, the other thing I wanna point out on this, um, uh, on, in this picture is that um, when you have the CAG expansion length of 40 and above, that's a fully penetrant HD allele. So someone with 40 repeats or above will develop symptoms of HD in their lifetime. If the uh, CAG expansion length is between 36 and 39, that's an uh, HD allele with reduced penetrance. So most people who have this range of CAG repeats tend to develop symptoms um, later in life and they tend to be milder. The next level down is CAG repeats of 27 to 35. And people who, who have that expansion range don't develop uh, symptoms of HD. However, if they pass on that allele to their offspring and there's a little bit of um, instability or there's always a um, few um, number change um, on either end, now if it expands just a little bit um, more, then their offspring would end up with somewhere between 36 to 39 repeats, which means then they might um, they'll likely develop uh, some kind of symptoms of um, HD. If the CAG length is 26 or, or smaller, that's, that's a normal allele. Um, a little bit more on CAG repeat size, as you can see on this graph here, um, above CAG repeat of 40, longer expansions result, tend to result in earlier age of onset of motor symptoms. But as you can also see on this graph, there's a lot of variability. So somebody with um, expansion length of 40, CAG repeat of 40, you can see the um, age of onset really ranges from under 20 years to you know, somewhere in their, in their 70s. So the CAG um, repeat length um, and age of onset, that association really accounts for maybe 50 to 60% of the variability. Um, and, and it is unpredictable. And what else accounts for that? Um, genetic modifiers is one. So some have been identified through GWAS studies. Um, they're likely unknown environmental factors that might also influence um, age of onset. Um, they're likely functional or structural properties of the mutant Huntington or its 
cleaved and post-translationally modified species. So those are all under investigation um, actively. And CAG repeat length also predict, can predict age at death, but not the duration of illness. And longer CAG repeats also result in increased rate of deterioration of motor, cognitive, and functional measures. And the mutant Huntington is what causes the neuronal dysfunction and death in HD. And it is what we believe produces the behavioral, cognitive, and motor symptoms of HD. And the increasing expression levels of mutant Huntington is associated with disease severity and toxicity. Whereas the wild type Huntington um, is critical and essential for embryonic neurodevelopment, as well as many other cellular functions. And uh, one slide on neuropathology. Um, you can see here on the left is the control brain, uh, C being caudate, P being putamen, and this is the HD brain. And the neuronal degeneration most severely affect, affects the medium spiny neurons um, in the caudate and putamen. So you can see the severe atrophy, very clear atrophy in the caudate and putamen of this um, HD brain. And on the right here is a 7T MRI of a control and a prodromal HD patient. And I think this patient was probably in his 30s or so, mid to late 30s. Um, this is not the most clear um, example per se, but um, putamen and caudate are smaller um, already in the prodromal phase in this, um, in this patient. And you can see the enlarged um, lateral ventricles there. So next, um, I'd like to talk about current treatments. So uh, for Korea, first of all, uh, one class of medications we have available are VMAT2 inhibitors, uh, vesicular monoamine transporter 2 inhibitors. And there are two uh, drugs that have been FDA approved here. One is tetrabenazine, and the other is a deuterated form of tetrabenazine called dutetrabenazine. And VMAT2 uh, inhibitors uh, essentially block the transport of dopamine into synaptic vesicles. And main side effects include sedation, Parkinsonism, uh, such as bradykinesia and rigidity, given that it's dopamine depleting. And there's a black box warning for depression um, as, well, as well as suicidality. So um, my main um, sort of example of using VMAT2 inhibitors would be in someone who um, really predominantly has motor symptoms of chorea. And if they have depression, that wouldn't necessarily make me stop from using VMAT2 inhibitors, uh, but I uh, need to make sure that the depression is well controlled and well monitored. Now, another option for Korea is um, other dopamine receptor blocking agents. Um, a, a very uh, commonly used one is risperidone and related drugs. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't cause depression. And another advantage, potential advantage, is that it can be helpful for irritability and other emotional symptoms. So if a patient has uh, chorea and um, irritability, um, that would be a good case to use, a, a use risperidone to really address both issues. Now, there are also uh, treatment uh, options available for other features of HD. So all the emotional and behavioral symptoms, a lot of them have effective treatments um, just for anyone, just like we would do for anyone else who has depression, anxiety, and irritability. Uh, we would try SSRIs and other antidepressants. For irritability and psychosis, again, risperidone or other second generation dopamine receptor blockers. Apathy, first uh, we need to try and roll out depression as it can mimic um, apathy. Uh, again, we try SSRIs, uh, but uh, it is harder to treat apathy pharmacologically. And all of the behavioral symptoms, in addition to the pharmacological therapy, can benefit from behavioral interventions, education, 
and psychotherapy. And social issues are often quite uh, disabling for the patients and um, appropriate social and behavioral interventions can be very helpful in increasing their quality of life. So for example, we have a dedicated social worker that will help um, help them fill out disability paperwork with the government, um, find housing or other um, programs in the community um, for various social issues that the patients experience. Okay, so um, those were uh, current treatments and now I'd like to talk about current clinical trials. So uh, brief overview of therapeutics. So 1872 was the initial thorough description of HD. And by 1993, that's when the HD gene itself was identified. And for 30, 40 years, um, many medications were tried for symptomatic therapy. And then the two VMAT2 inhibitors were approved for Korea treatments, the tetrabenazine in 2008 and tetrabenazine in 2017. Um, as of yet, uh, there's no disease-modifying therapy. And this is within the past couple of years um, is when things um, have gotten a lot more exciting. Um, so just to review um, HD pathogenesis, um, it all has to do with the, um, not all has to do with, but um, this really drives home the point that mutant Huntington um, contains that expanded um, polyglutamine tract that leads to the formation of the mutated Huntington protein, which leads to the neuronal death um, and, uh, and the symptoms of HD. So in the past few years, a major focus has been uh, development and testing of therapies that target proximally in HD pathogenesis. So namely, by targeting either the HTT, the Huntington DNA, um, uh, RNA, either at the pre-mRNA level or at the mRNA level, um, and the protein, which is not shown here. And among these, um, antisense oligonucleotides, or ASOs, are the most clinically developed. So ASOs, um, now they're delivered um, directly into the CSF via intrathecal injections. That's because they do not cross the blood-brain barrier and the distribution of the drug um, to the brain parenchyma is through passive diffusion. So as you inject into the back, um, you know, with the CSF transport, your hope, uh, we are getting passive diffusion and also active um, ASO transport um, to the neuronal and glial cells. And with the ASOs, multiple repeat injections are required to maintain therapeutic levels. And just how often that needs to be is what's also uh, being figured out in these clinical trials. And the goal um, with the current trials is to reduce the Huntington protein level by somewhere between 50 to 80%. What is the right percentage in order to lead to meaningful um, improvement? That's, that's also what's under question. Um, and this is the phase one data using this uh, intrathecal drug, uh, intrathecal ASO drug called HTTRX. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. And this is again from the phase one study um, with 40, 46 um, participants. And the main message is that there was dose dependent reduction in the concentration of mutant Huntington in the CSF and there were no serious uh, adverse events. And so uh, the dotted line, so this shows the percentage change in the concentration of mutant HTT in the CSF from baseline, which is the dotted line, to the last available time point. And these individual circles are the individual patients and the horizontal lines in each of these groups uh, represent the uh, group means. So in the two highest dose groups, so 90 milligram and two, uh, 120 milligram groups, they saw 40% reduction in mutant Huntington from baseline. So that was very encouraging. And now we're in phase three um, with that drug. Um, and I'll talk more about it in the next slide. Um, 
Now, there are two types of ASOs that are being studied for HD right now, and one is a total Huntington lowering a ASO, and the other is allele selective. So for total HTT lowering um, ASO, you are reducing both the wild type and the mutant Huntington, and therefore it's unclear right now um, how much lowering of wild type um, is okay in the adult brain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in the embryonic brain, it's uh, wild type Huntington is critical and essential, but it's um, it's there's no clear answer right now in terms of how much wild type we can um, eliminate in the adult brain. The other type of ASO is allele selective. So then you would leave the wild type alone and just try to lower the mutant um, Huntington. And in this um, study that has the allele selective Huntington uh, lowering therapy, um, they're targeting uh, SNPs that are linked to the HD mutation. And there are two drugs, and they're targeting the two most common SNPs. Now, not everybody has those two SNPs. So if the drug works, it could treat two-thirds of the population with the Huntington mutation, but not everyone. So these are the current ASO clinical trials in HD. And the first two are linked. So Generation HD1 is the phase three pivotal start, uh, study of that um, ASO drug uh, for which the phase one data was, were published. And this is looking at the intrathecal um, drug, which is now called RG6042. Um, the other study is called GenExtend, and that's an open label study using the same intrathecal ASO. This third study here called Precision HD1 and Precision HD2, um, this is the allele specific ASO. The top two are the total um, Huntington lowering drug and the Precision HD1 and Precision HD2 are the um, allele specific ASOs. And this is, um, they tried uh, four different doses and the highest dose was 16 milligrams. And they, that led to 12% 12 per, 12 reduction of mutant Huntington. Um, so, you know, if you recall, the Roche, the um, yeah, the Roche study had 40% lowering. Um, but of course, that was at um, 90 milligrams and 120 milligrams. Um, so this was, you know, it's it's basically not um, directly comparable. Um, but given that. Um, this allele-specific drug was safe and uh, did lead to 12% reduction at their highest dose of 16 milligrams. Um, they're doubling the highest dose to 32 milligrams now, and, um, and they'll see what happens with that. Um, the other drug that's in um, HD clinical trials is RNAi or RNA interference, and that's um, uh, acting on the mRNA level. And um, it's a microRNA targeting Huntington mRNA, and it's delivered via recombinant adeno-associated virus. And it's a different type of AAV, depending on um, what, uh, what company is doing the study. Um, so that would be um, injected directly into the striatum or other uh, potential areas in, in, basal, in the basal ganglia. And this would be Again, total Huntington lowering would be non-selective degradation of both mutant and wild type Huntington mRNA. And um, the recombinant AAVs don't integrate into the host genome, uh, but they remain as nuclear episomes. So that would result in stable gene expression and potentially would require a single administration with permanent effects. And this is the first RNAi that's in clinical trials for HD. It's called AMT130. This is a phase one, two open label study. And it, it's randomized um, to uh, either sham surgery or uh, receiving the drug intra uh, striatally. And this, uh, this particular drug is using AAV5, recombinant AAV5. Um, combined with microRNA uh, in early HD. 
So again, a summary of uh, strategies to lower Huntington expression. So the top half here um, is the ASOs. And so this is pre-mRNA degradation and either um, allele specific like SNP targeted or, um, or no um, specificity. So total Huntington lowering and the delivery is intrathecal. And the key advantage would be um, if it's uh, total uh, Huntington lowering, then that could um, address everyone with um, HD mutation. If it's allele specific, um, that would uh, you know, put aside the concern of lowering the wild type HD, uh, HTT, but um, it would only be able to help two thirds of those with the specific SNPs. Um, the bottom uh, half are the RNA interference compounds and the target is mRNA degradation and there is no allele selectivity. It will be um, all uh, Huntington lowering. Delivery would be intracranial and you can see that different companies are using different AAVs and the targets are slightly different um, among these companies as well. Um, within the striatum. And potential advantage, if it works, would be that a single treatment would provide sustained Huntington reduction. And the flip side would be if it doesn't work, the effects are permanent. Um, just one slide on um, future directions. Um, this slide, uh, this picture is to show there are a lot of different areas um, for drug engagement. Um, and there are studies, active studies in zinc, zinc finger transcription factor and CRISPR-Cas9 at the DNA level. Um, no human studies that I'm aware of that are ready yet. Um, and other small molecule splicing modulators are um, also being studied. So in conclusion, um, HD is an autosomal dominant disease due to CAG expansion and mutant Huntington protein production. And the refinement of diagnosis may lead to earlier interventions in the pre-manifest period, especially with the potential success of um, disease-modifying therapies. And currently, symptomatic therapies are available for treatment of chorea and emotional symptoms of HD. And ASOs and RNAi are potentially disease-modifying agents, which target the Huntington mRNA, which reduce the mutant Huntington. And eventually combining Huntington lowering and likely other modalities may be optimal for disease modifying treatment for HD. And this is um, some of the staff at the Johns Hopkins Huntington Disease Center. Um, up here, this is the um, research team. And in the middle here are myself and Dr. Christopher Ross, and my colleague um, in the HD Center, who's also the center director. Um, doing our ASO injections uh, with our clinical participants um, who, to whom we are very grateful for being a part of this uh, really exciting set of trials. And uh, bottom row shows some of our um, basic science colleagues um, who are um, focusing on um, HD research. And these are my references which will be available and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Jeevan, thank you very much. It was very lucid and the message was clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Rishi, um, you take the questions? Yeah, there's some questions and I'll take some of them, a lot of questions. Raji, first of all, uh, you must be aware that the more than 250 people who participated here, around 250 persons. Okay. So, I'll try uh, to get to some of the questions. <laughs> the questions, I'll start uh, with one simple thing. Uh, mm -hmm. They're asking that what are the ethical status of testing HD in family members of patients? Suppose a patient who, ha who has 16 years born, what is the ethical status of testing HD for him? This is a question from Abhijit, yeah. 
Okay, so at least in the US, we do not test anybody under the age of 18 years. And, um, you know, it's considered a form of coercion to have someone be tested when they're not symptomatic. So pre-symptomatic testing, as we call it, in somebody who has the risk of a developing HD but doesn't know the genetic status, um, we do not perform um, genetic testing in those um, uh, people. If uh, the person is symptomatic um, and is uh, suspected to have HD and, and those are you know, why they're having those symptoms, then we would test um, that individual. But as long as they're asymptomatic or, or pre-symptomatic, um, we would not test that um, child. No, not childhood. Okay, this was childhood. But suppose a patient whose father is, has HD and mm -hmm. he is say, 28, planning to get married. What uh -huh. is the status of uh, doing test for him? For the um, so the father has been tested positive for HD, and yeah. and the son who is 28 yeah. um, wants to be tested for himself or the yes. child. Yes. No, or, for himself. So, because. For himself. Yeah. Um, so if the father has been tested and is known to have HD, the 28-year-old um, son can, you know, choose to be tested. Yeah. Um, and, and then he'll know the sort of his own risk and, and that'll, uh, you know, imp have impact on his, um, you know, family planning and so on. Um, but one twist to that would be if the parent hasn't been tested, um, and, and especially if the parent is symptomatic, um, and they do not wish to be tested, but if the son still goes ahead and gets tested and, and tests positive, let's say, then that would automatically test a father um, positive, which is an interesting ethical situation. And, and we encourage um, families in that situation to really have an open discussion um, because when the son is tested um, positive, that would test a father positive automatically. Do you suggest genetic counseling in those cases who are asymptomatic and they're going for a test? So yes, so in the US, um, we have uh, several, uh, many centers of um, excellence. So HD um, centers of excellence is, is how, how, what the term is. Um, the standard is that anyone who comes in for um, pre-symptomatic testing or even symptomatic testing um, are, um, well, strongly recommended, but our, our clinic protocol is that they are um, going to undergo genetic counseling followed by um, neurological and um, brief neuropsychological evaluation. And then um, they also meet with our social worker because their implications um, regarding their um, you know, life insurance and long-term disability insurance and things like that. So after they go through all of those and at the end of that visit, um, they can make the um, final decision on whether they still wanna go ahead and be tested or not. And then after they're tested, they're always, um, the results are always revealed in person with the same genetic counseling team. So there's both pre and post um, test genetic counseling as, as part of the protocol. Uh, Dr. Smita Chandan, she asked, she's intrigued that how come haloperidol is used to treat chorea as well it causes chorea? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so one thing about using, whether it's haloperidol or second generation like risper risper risperidone and so on, um, the evidence is really anecdotal. So anecdotally, um, especially um, before the uh, atypical um, antipsychotics became available, um, it really you know, seemed to help and does seem to help um, Korea. Uh, but it's, again, it's anecdotal. So we still have, uh, there are a handful I can think of that are still, um, that feel um, are helped by haloperidol. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a good point, but uh, all of these are anecdotal and they haven't been really directly compared against one another. That's great. Uh, someone who's anonymous, he asked that, can the repeat length, the CAG repeat length, decrease with age in a patient. So can CAG repeat length change with age? Um, so in general, no. So we don't have many patients that are being tested repeatedly. We do have patients that are 
tested it, you know twice or so because you know they were either you know they couldn't find their results and later found them or um, they you know really wanted to be tested again but um, didn't really share that with us um, and later we find out they had been tested um, but uh, it, it, it's more of a laboratory um, variability that we may see one or two um, CAG expansion difference, um, but there's no um, clear evidence that I'm aware of that um, shows CAG decreases with age. CAG is, is pretty stable throughout uh, the lifetime of the individual. Dr. Vivek asked a simple question that any experience of DBS or stem cell therapy in HD? Yeah, good question. Um, DBS, uh, I don't have personal experience, but what I can see is um, there really hasn't been a you know, clear um, clinical trial that's been you know, robustly designed that showed any evidence of um, uh, efficacy with DBS nor stem cell um, treatment. So there's currently no um, uh, approved therapy for HD using those modalities. Wong Kevike. He has thrown a historical term and asked some clarity about that. The term is subchoric status. How common is subchoric status and how to differentiate it from old age subtle chorea? So can you tell something about subchoric status? Subchoric status, is that status, what you're saying? Status, exactly. Um, so how do you differentiate Korea from HD from sort of age-related Korea? Is that the question? Yeah, I understand that the word, uh, say, 30 years back, that was used status uh, sub -Korea. That was seen oh. in older HD patients. Uh -huh. They had uh, stratal atrophy. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the yeah, question is essentially that how to differentiate old age Korea, which is benign Korea, which is, uh, you can get senile Korea with mm -hmm. HD. Yeah, so I think that really um, rely that would have to rely heavily on family history and accompanying um, clinical symptoms. So if they you know have the Korea um, that looks you know indistinguishable, um, and there's also accompanying psychiatric history um, or other emotional cognitive symptoms, um, but you know the most definitive answer would be um, HD genetic testing. Uh, the nice question from Dr. Kumar Bismaya that uh, the chorea or symptoms in HD evolves with age, right? So how do you explain mm -hmm. reduction in chorea and emergence of other symptoms as the patient grows older? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, I guess it has to do with the either the, the involuntary versus voluntary systems. Um, and the effects of um, the atrophy evolving over time. Um, I, you know, I can't think of sort of a, a definitive study explaining that um, sort of burning, burning off or, or plateauing of the Korea symptoms. And, um, you know, whether that's um, selective, um, uh, you know, selective um, neuro, uh, degeneration or, or atrophy of these regions um, that somehow change with aging. Um, I, yeah, I don't have a great clear answer to it, um, but if actually if another movement neuro neurologist here has a um, thought on that, I, I'd actually be interested in hearing that, their thought. All right. uh, we can talk about a little later, mm -hmm. but uh, because we have small, little time and a few more questions are left. Okay. Uh, Social cognition in HD, is it involved? If yes, what are the neural correlates of it? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, whether social cognition is involved or not in HD, social cognition. Social cognition? Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? Like, um... uh, uh, what I understand from because this is just what I understand from social interaction means how, um, how to uh, treat with the peer, how to treat with the family members. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the ability to um, well, I think one example would be it's not. I'm, I'm not quite sure it's uh, what 
your definition of uh, or the questioner's definition of social recognition is, but there is an impaired ability to recognize um, their own symptoms, for example. There's an so significant anosognosia, um, uh, but their uh, perception is is also altered. Um, so there are studies, you know, looking at sort of um, uh, you know how they would um, deal with uh, reward uh, situation. Um, evaluating that situation, um, but also um, I, I, I do believe emotional um, perception, um, social um, recognition is is impaired. Great, Professor Jeeves. So we have two, three minutes left. Let's take up two questions at least. What are the optimal dose of tetrabenazine you find chorea to be controlled in your clinical practice? What, Sorry, is, the what, are, the, what is the optimum dose of tetrabenazine? Uh -huh. Uh, you use your your know, clinical practice. Yeah, that that really varies. So I have people that are very sensitive and will respond at twelve point five milligrams BID or TID, um, whereas I have people that I need to get up uh, much higher. So um, you know, over definitely over a hundred um, milligrams or so. So um, I believe it is um, pretty individual dependent, but. Um, you might consider um, uh, CYP testing if um, you have a particularly poor responder um, to tetrabenazine. That's sort of the quick answer. Quickly, juvenile HD, why they're different? Why they have more Parkinsonism? Yeah, so that's, um, I think that's uh, something I can't answer very briefly um, in this setting. Yeah. I think that's a whole nother talk. Yeah. Okay, one last question I would say. Uh, any difference of CRISPR-Cas9 system versus CRISPR-Cas13 system in disease modifying therapy? Yeah, I, I don't think there's um, really enough that's been done yet to be able to really get down to that um, fine level of detail when it comes to you know HD-specific therapies. I'm hoping there'll be more data soon in the near future. So, I think uh, we have covered this so, all, all questions. Sir, uh, she said one question, if you allow. Yes, Ashish. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, what is the relation with CAG repeat and weight loss? Is there any connection? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of studies that look directly at the uh, weight loss and CAG, but it is, you know, obviously very difficult for people to maintain weight as the disease uh, progresses. And we think that's a combination of a lot of different uh, factors, you know, fundamental metabolic change, um, in addition to the pure just burning off of calories from Korea. Um, but, you know, it's definitely multifactorial, but um, I'm not aware of CAG length itself um, having an association with the weight loss per se. And then one more question. Uh, in the pre-manifest patients, uh, I think striatal atrophy is visible around 10 to 20 years earlier. So mm -hmm. why does it take for the clinical manifestations to come? Like, is there any amount or percent of neurons to get affected, like in Parkinson's disease? Yeah, so that, that's, that's my understanding. But where the actual cutoff is, um, is not as clear. But there's uh, that clearly some amount of decompensation or some amount of compensation that's allowed for, for, for quite some time. And that's you know, all the more reason that's important to have you know, reliable bioimaging markers so that we can get to these people earlier before, you know, again, because by the time the symptoms are there, it's, it's it already progressed quite a bit. The process advanced quite a bit. Thank you, ma'am. Rishi, sir? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kotari, are you here? Thank you. Yeah, I'm there. Thank you, G. My dog is uh, disturbing, so I have some <laughs> No worries. That's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was a very comprehensive talk. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, Thank you. Thank it you. was wonderful to be with you. Nice. Have a great night. Thank you. And we'll see you again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank